Let's talk with Colonel uh, Simon Diggins. He's a military and defence an analyst and a former defence attaché in Kabul. Uh, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Julie. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, it's amazing developments, actually, both in Gaza and in Ukraine, the two wars that we're, we're dealing with most uh, in, in, in Europe, indeed. Um, and in terms of where we are with Gaza, we had this proposal straight after Donald Trump was in the news for his conviction uh, of these uh, these charges involving the payments to Stormy Daniels. Um, and then suddenly we had this announcement, surprise announcements from Joe Biden, saying that there was going to be, uh, on Friday, there was, there was this, this Gaza peace deal that was on the table, a proposal from Israel. It doesn't appear to be a proposal that many of those in the Israeli government do actually support. But um, what, what do you make of the, the deal on offer and the likelihood that anything will come out of it? it? It's not very different from some of the deals we've had proposed earlier on. So it starts with a ceasefire. That's kind of the first phase. Uh, and there'll be some exchange of hostages during, uh, during that, uh, that, that period. Uh, it then moves into a period, what they, they term so a permanent ceasefire. Uh, where, where what is a temporary pause in fighting turns into something more, more, more long term. And the third phase is then kind of some reconstruction and everything that goes with that. So it's not very different from what we've seen, uh, seen before. Um, I think the difference now is that it's, it's theoretically got the Americans very clearly behind it. They've also claimed and stated that it's an Israeli proposal, which they're now putting forward. So there's a certain amount of kind of repackaging in terms of how, how, how it looks. But as you rightly point out, it's run into, if you like, the sands of Israeli internal politics. Uh, and it's not at all clear that Benjamin Netanyahu can bring his coalition of people with him as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the thing. He's got he's propped up by those on the right wing who are basically saying, look, we don't even care about the hostages coming out as much as we care about destroying Hamas. But there'll be a lot of people in Israel who care about both um, and, and getting rid of ha ha Hamas. I mean, Hamas is still firing, you know, all, despite all that's happened over the last seven, eight months, still firing uh, rockets, even as, you know, as far as Tel Aviv. Uh, from from Rafa, so I mean, they are Hamas are still a threat. There is this big concern that once there's a ceasefire, it allows the regrouping. The idea of the hostage exchange, well, hostage exchange with with with, polit with political well with prisoners, sorry, being held by Israel. Apologies for that. Um, that that you know something just basically talks going on and on and on without an end date. Well, that's in Hamas's interest, isn't it? The only the only side that benefits from that really other than the hostages, of course, is Hamas. I think Israel also benefits if it can be a, a permanent ceasefire where there's actually peace. And one of the things that Netanyahu said is that there's got to be a peace whereby Gaza was not a threat to Israel as well. And that's the tricky bit. So the tricky bit is, will Hamas actually hold its ceasefire? And it's very easy to break ceasefires. Mm. It's very easy to say, oh, well, one side's done one thing and we're just responding to that. Yeah. So there is that, that element as well. Uh, whether or not they can actually persuade Hamas to effectively to stand down is very difficult. And this is where the one bit of the Israeli policy that I think everyone has been looking for is kind of a political strategy that divorces the people of Gaza from, from Hamas. Hamas. Even though, of course, if you had an election, according to polls taken in recent years in Gaza, um, the majority of people would vote for Hamas. And their entire point, their, 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 the reason for being, is the destruction of Israel and the annihilation of the Jewish people. Indeed, and the challenge there is that the one thing that's missing from this, even though we're talking about reconstruction, is any kind of conversation around the two-state solution, because that is a, that's a kind of the, the long-term promise that's been on the table really since 2000, 2005, yeah. when the Israelis withdrew from Gaza from there. And there's nothing in here at the moment yet about that. That's the one thing, if there was a, a, a roadmap that led to that. Yeah, and, 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 a, and a roadmap to a moderate, a moderate Palestinian leadership. But that really isn't an offer. And those who were considered on the moderate wing, by all accounts, according to the Sunday papers, being, uh, uh, you know, as they, as, as they sort of pop up, basically, being uh, assassinated by... By the, by the likes of Hamas. Can I take you also to Ukraine? Because, again, we're dealing with both at this time. Um, again, interesting development in Ukraine where Zelensky, uh, the president of Ukraine, has been told by Joe Biden that he can use American-made, American-supplied weapons to fire into Russian territory. That was something that was strictly forbidden uh, until this point. Is that a game-changer in terms of their ability to defeat the Russian forces? I think what it's not necessarily a game changer. What it does, though, is give them a reasonable chance of defence. Um, and the actual permission that Biden has given has been fairly restrictive. Um, he's talking about a line in the area of Kharkiv. Now, Kharkiv is only 40 kilometres 
from the uh, the Russian the Russian border. Yeah. So what the Russians have been doing, they've been using long range missiles, uh, particularly air attack missiles. They're firing them from inside Russia, knowing that the Ukrainians can't really respond to them from there. And so what this now does is give them permission to fire into that area uh, and engage the, the, the Russians, uh, if you like, in their bases and everything goes there. And Russia has been exploiting that advantage right from the very beginning uh, in terms of what they've been able to do. So I think this actually just evens things up. Not necessarily a game changer, though, but just start yeah. to rebalance where yeah. we were before. We always seem to be chasing our tail on this front. I don't know why we just didn't, you know, we hadn't had that delay in the US weapons getting to Ukraine. Perhaps could be further ahead.